Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have Mark Blanchett, the CEO of H2O Innovation. H2O Innovation trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol HEO and on the OTC under HEOFF. The company is trading at about $1.91 with roughly 77 million shares outstanding or about $147 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andreola. Hey, thanks, Trevor. Um, yes, welcome here, uh, Mark Blanchett. Um, we've got uh, an interview today with a company that, that we, we've done a little bit of work on, but really want to um, you know, get a good understanding of what H2O Innovation does. So happy to have Mark here. Uh, Mark, welcome. Um, I understand you have a presentation for us. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Uh, yes, I, uh, does everyone, do you guys see my screen? Uh, Paul, do you see my screen? I can see something there, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think we've got it. I, I see a bunch of uh, icons there. Okay, so perfect. So that's the intro slide here. Um, what you see, uh, you see three pictures of H2O innovation um, of our three different pillars. So. Um, as you said, H2 Innovation is a, uh, is a company that has been trading on the TS6V Canada Mark, uh, head office. Yes? Just to interrupt, we, we can see your black, uh, blank black screen, but not your actual corporate presentation. So if you okay. open up the presentation there, uh, it should show on your screen. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll do a new share. You should see it. Is it better? There yeah. we go. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. No okay. worries. Okay, so, um, so the picture you see right now, uh, I mean, obviously H2 Innovation, our logo, uh, and the fact that we're traded on the CSXV, we're also traded on the Alternex uh, in Europe and uh, on the OTCQX in the States. Um, H2 Innovation is a uh, water treatment company head office in Quebec City, but we have offices all over North America and in Europe as well. Uh, you can see here the three different pictures of what we do. So um, we have three different business pillars. Uh, we built water treatment plants, we operate them, and uh, we uh, provide different consumables and chemicals for the operation and maintenance. So I'll jump here on that, that slide. That slide is, uh, is a heavy slide, but tells quickly uh, in a nutshell what we do. Uh, so the company overview is, uh, as I said, we're providing water treatment solutions for municipal and industrial customers. Um, essentially in North America, where we have a very strong presence, as you can see on that, that map there. Uh, so we're uh, having two manufacturing facility that manufactures the systems, one in the province of Quebec and one in Minneapolis. Um, we have delivered over 750 water treatment plants in North America and a bit abroad. Um, we provide service and aftermarket for those water treatment services. So that's here at the bottom, um, we call that the, uh, the business pillar WTS, Water Technology and Services. Then uh, what we do, we uh, capture also part of the international market with specialty products so our second business pillar. Uh, in, the, in the graph here, you can see that this uh, business pillar is in the green. So the specialty products essentially is a distribution business. So we have about 120 distributors across the world that uh, really distributes our, our, our different type of specialty products. So we have chemicals that are used for water treatment facilities. And we have also other components that we use for the desalination, big desalination plants. We export a lot in Asia, like in, in China, for example, we export for more than 2 million of chemicals per year. In the Middle East also, uh, we do a lot of business in the Middle East where there is uh, a lot of, of uh, issues related to water going on over there and, and it's a very big market for us. Um, our specialty products are manufactured in California and in the UK and uh, we have a very important office also in, uh, in Spain. The third business pillar is what you see in the graph there on the left, uh, the purple. So it's uh, following an acquisition we did in 2016 of a company called Utility Partners. Uh, we're doing operation and maintenance of uh, water treatment facilities. So this is a business that's doing business essentially in the United States, uh, a small presence in Canada, in Western Canada. Basically, um, 
it's what we do is we operate the plant of the city. So uh, instead of having city workers operating water and wastewater facilities, it's our employees that are doing that. So it's a very uh, intensive uh, HR business. So um, out of the 700 employees of H2O, it's uh, about 500 employees that are working for that business pillar, so that division. It has grown through uh, acquisition. So the first one we did was utility partners. And then we, we bought over the last two years, two companies in Texas, one called Hayes and another one called, called uh, Gus. Uh, and, and we are uh, right now um, in, the, in the process of integrating all of it uh, under one brand, which, is, which will be H2O Innovation uh, Operation and Maintenance Arm. So uh, to reinforce the brand of H2O Innovation. So this before Christmas, will, will, it'll be finalized and will be under one brand of H2O. Um, so today we are operating on that business segment about 200 to, uh, well, we're 275 now, uh, 275 different utilities. So that brings a lot of recurring revenues. So today um, it's 85% 85 of, our of our revenues that are recurrent. So operation and maintenance are extremely recurrent and uh, specialty products since most of it are, uh, are essentially consumable. So it brings a lot of visibility when we uh, forecast our, our revenues and uh, over the years has, has brought also a lot of stability for, for the investors in terms of uh, forecasting. Um, so uh, I won't go over the whole slide deck or I'll go quickly over some, some of the slides because uh, I think we wanna make it uh, quite short and efficient and, and allow uh, you guys to ask some questions. But, um, essentially, uh, as I said earlier, we are providing uh, water treatment services and equipment for different industries, um, heavy industries such as power, oil and gas, uh, refinery, mining, uh, lighter industries, food and bev, and agriculture and irrigation. And the municipal sector is a strong uh, arm for us, which uh, represent about 70% of our revenues. Um, we have a very unique proposition and a lot of people are asking uh, the question, you know, what's the differentiator? What, what makes H2 innovation uh, different from, from the other uh, players out there? Well, our main differentiator is that we are like a one-stop shop for a customer. Uh, we're the only company that addresses the small and medium-sized communities um, with an integrated solution. So, when we see a customer, we can build his system, we can operate it and provide him with the consumables. It avoids the customer to be caught in the middle of those different uh, suppliers where, you know, if, if a company provides a system but does not operate it, when the customer has issues with it, you know, he's in the middle of all, you know, the suppliers pointing fingers at each other. So uh, our objective really is to support small and mid-sized communities where uh, you know, the director of public work is the guy that takes care of the snow, of the parks, of, the, the, you know, uh, of everything basically. And the mayor is the guy who's sometimes just the most charismatic farmer around. Uh, so those small and mid-sized communities are not uh, well uh, serviced by, by water uh, suppliers. Um, you know, our competitors are, are Veolia, Suez, uh, or, or other big uh, companies like that, and they don't go at the small and mid-sized community. So, um, so this is how we position ourselves. Really, our strategy is is really to to be like the one-stop shop and integrate, uh, have an integrated approach, and and then maximize customer uh, re uh, retention by by not only providing him the system, but be there for the long run with the operation and maintenance and the consumables. And therefore, for our investors. It allows to bring a lot of uh, stability in, in our financial, uh, financial forecast. Here is an example of a project where, where really we have been able to uh, integrate all our, our different offers. So um, that's a partner that we're working with called Sustainable Water. Uh, basically Sustainable Water, what it does, they, they go and see different campus. So it could be university campus, industrial campus, um, hospitals and and they say what's the cost of your water and what's the cost of your wastewater and and they offer to subsidize that by building a plant so that's the plant you see here uh, and they build very pretty plants with 
uh, you know, a, a, a greenhouse, uh, and it seems like the roots are are are, are treating the wastewater uh, at the back. It's one of our big plants uh, where we, we we do water reuse, so we treat the wastewater up to a potable level and reinject the the potable water in their irrigation systems or even for consumption. So it's really a a, a water recycle project. So uh, instead of of paying for water and paying for discharge, uh, they have the, the campus here will have its own plant and uh, they will uh, they will they, they, they won't have to pay for, for water and, and discharge anymore and just uh, you know have, have their own and water uh, plant. So uh, we've done five projects with them so far uh, with uh, Cummins and uh, Cummins industry uh, that big uh, heavy industry business. Uh, one for Duke University, another one for Piedmont University, uh, Philip Morris. Um, so uh, an example of this project here, it's uh, the CapEx was 3.2 million. So it's, it's uh, the project we built, that's a one-off. But thereafter, uh, the, the tail of that project brings uh, $50,000 of chemicals per year, and it's a contract of operation and maintenance of five years for 3.3 uh, million for that duration. So uh, nice project, not only one-off, but we're securing recurring revenue in the back end. Um, growth story, I mean, it, the company was founded in 2000, uh, evolves today uh, with different acquisition. We want to highlight the fact that here, uh, you know, uh, acquisition is part of our strategy. So merging acquisition, uh, the water business is a very fragmented market. And, and therefore, there is a lot of opportunities of M&A. Uh, and and uh, in order to, to generate uh, different uh, synergy, cost synergy, uh, selling synergies. Uh, that's an example of, of a recent acquisition we did. Uh, we uh, were already uh, owning a company called PWT since 2009. It's a company of chemicals. Uh, we bought Genesis, another company of chemicals in the UK. Uh, and, and so we have, uh, you know, captured a lot of synergies by combining those two businesses together and allows us today to have the largest uh, distribution network of specialty chemicals. We have 100 distributors just for uh, the chemical businesses. So uh, provides us with a very unique position in, uh, in, in, in the industry of chemistry. Other example of acquisition we've done in, in the Houston area, uh, where now uh, we have for about $25 million worth of business recurring in Houston. Um, so today, highlight of H2O, it's a 133 million business, uh, significant increase compared to last year. Uh, gross profit margin uh, reached just below 27% this year. Uh, what's interesting is our adjusted EBITDA. So we have not only been able to generate growth, but uh, also uh, improving uh, the EBITDA and the EBITDA margin. So our focus is really to increase profitability of the company. So we we want to become attractive not only by, by bringing recurring revenue, but also increasing profitability. So uh, adjusted EBITDA was at 12.5 million, so representing 9.4% compared to 6.1 previous year. Uh, and, and, and the uh, adjusted EBITDA and the cash flow from uh, operating activities are also quite close uh, since we don't have a lot of CapEx. Uh, so cash flow generated was uh, 12.3 million. Uh, and the Q4 was really strong. We're really proud of it. So for the one that's been following us for a few years, uh, uh, it, it's a demonstration when everything goes towards the, the right direction, how this company can perform. So we generated 13.4% of, of adjusted EBITDA. And, and it's awkward to say that, you know, Q4 for us was uh, April 1st until June 30. The whole world was really suffering from... Uh, COVID from uh, lockdown uh, and confinement. And, and I'm saying here that, you know, when everything goes well for us, I mean, that's, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, we're not affected by the, pan the, the, the pandemic. We're not affected by COVID. Uh, we're lucky, I knock on wood all the time, but uh, I mean, uh, you know, not because there is a COVID that people will stop drinking water and flushing their toilets. Actually, they, uh, they realize probably how uh, a business like us can can de-risk their uh, municipal affairs or, or operation and maintenance because of the the, the debt we have in, in the organization. So, um, so business for H2 has been uh, fairly good, uh, very good. And 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 as I said, when when 
everything goes towards the right direction, how how performance our our our, uh, our uh, business can be is is uh, is being showed at Q4. Um, I could go business pillar by business pillar. We have a lot of information on that uh, on that uh, slide deck. Uh, there, there is a. I, I think I'll give a chance to to you guys to ask questions. So Paul, what what do you propose here at this point? You know, I've been talking for twenty minutes. Yeah, no, I can give you a chance to take a breath. There, you've done a great job. Um, I, I think you covered a lot of the things that typically we we ask. Um, I, I guess the big one right at the top is um, I, I can just imagine there, there's a massive market opportunity, but maybe give us more details. Like you're, I, I've seen you know Saudi Arabia, I've seen the U.S., but geographically, where do you guys really operate, and what's the what's the potential for the markets you're currently in? Yes, so uh, I mean you're right. I mean the the water market, the addressable market. I mean. So sometimes I've been asked, what's the addressable market of the water? I mean, it's a, it's, you know, it's humongous, but how big it is, you know, it's uh, what the data we have. And, and it's fun because we're, we're, we're into that right now. We're, we're building a three year strategic plan with, with some of the board and members. And so the market, the addressable market is, is above 800 billion. Uh, but that of that market, you know, not all of it is, is our addressable market because water, you know, you got water in, in everything. So yeah, fluid and, and, and water is, is, is all over. So what is our addressable market of H2O, you know, with all our business pillars that so our addressable market is closer to about 5 billion. So that's the playground. Uh, when I said earlier how fragmented the uh, industry is, just to give you an idea, the biggest player in our industry is Veolia. And Veolia is a $10 billion revenue company. So it doesn't even have 1% of the addressable market. You know, think about that. So, and then you got Suez was about that same size. I mean, together combined, they won't, they don't even have to one and a half percent of the old addressable market of water. So it's, it's a very big market. It's very fragmented. And there are a lot of plays for small players like us to, to grow. So, um, where then to focus because, you know, we receive tons of great ideas all the time. You know, why don't you go there? Why don't you go there? They don't have water. Um, so first we focus on, on, you know, where we have relation, where we have an added value uh, and, and, and where uh, quality is important. Uh, so we've been in India a few years ago. You know, quality was not an, an issue there. They, they weren't looking for that. They were looking for price and cheap stuff. We stayed there for two years and a half and we closed business over there with hell. Um, but for the Saudi, that's really important. United States is really important. And China, uh, they also looking for some uh, very high end stuff, especially in China. We're working a lot with the food and beverage industry that are North American companies or European. So Nestle, Danone, Coca-Cola, Budweiser, uh, you know, those, uh, food and Bev, uh, they they want to have consumables that are made in USA product. That's where we're very strong. We also in the Saudi, uh, here's a market and info that's really interesting. Uh, what's going on in the Saudi? Uh, so uh, so that's are the plan under construction. So Saudi, uh, they've they've built 50 years ago a lot of of technology under evaporation. So they evaporate sea, sea water to generate potable water. And they're all coming at the same time to some sort of a uh, uh, end of, of, of life cycle. And they're refurbishing or, or rebuilding new plants using membrane, sorry, membrane filtration. So it's called SWRO, seawater reverse osmosis. So that's the, the technology. Reverse osmosis is, is membrane filtration. So or it's, it's the technology around which H2O has, has built his, his expertise. Uh, in 2017, so here's the data. So, uh, so those are capex investment in in the desal, okay, uh, industry, global desalination market here, capex. In 2019, 2021, there's a very important uh, investment boom, I could call. Uh, so those are, 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 you know, eight billion dollar on a yearly basis being invested in in capex and. You know that that important uh, boom is or burst is is coming from the Middle East. 
So uh, they are refurbishing all at the same time, like uh, a lot of, of, of their facilities. And uh, so it creates kind of a boom. So we position ourselves, we saw it coming, everyone in the industry saw it coming. Of course, we are not big enough or it was not smart to try to capture plants, but we said we should position ourselves with, with our specialty products. We've already had coupling uh, and, and develop filter housing, which is another uh, type of product and, and address that. And we had a good network working with our distributors and we were able to capture uh, a lot of those new plants. So all over the red dots you see here are plants that uh, we sold uh, some, some, uh, some piece of equipment. And, and one we're really proud of is Tawila. Tawila is going to be the biggest desalination plant ever built. Uh, it's 900, thousand cubic meters per day uh you know the biggest one three years ago was 400 cubic meters per day and look everything that's under construction right now so it's 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 humongous uh so our strategy now is to uh you know have our, our peat month equipment that are positioned there being converted into chemicals and the chemicals brings recurring revenue so using the peat month uh, position in the Middle East and, and convert that with uh, our, our strong position uh, with, with, with Genesis, the UK business that we've had, they, we just bought last year. Genesis already have a very good position in, in, in uh, the Middle East. And the objective is to, is to position them now that Pitman has, has good relationship position for capturing the chemical. And, and as you can see, the, the, I showed that slide earlier, but the, the CapEx is a burst, but the OPEX will be maintained. And, and that's the long play. Uh, you know, the long-term play is, is capturing uh, sales of chemicals that comes with higher gross profit margin and, and that are extremely recurrent. Um, so you, were, you know, in our strategy, where should we focus? To go back to your question, Paul, uh, we're, we're focusing where, where there are opportunity and when we have, where we have a differentiator and not for one-off. The first slide I said, you know, capture, that's our business here, maximize customer retention. So we're, 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 we're you know, same for here, uh, you know, when we built a system, if there is in the tail end operation and maintenance to it, uh, you know, between two projects, we'll, we'll focus on the one that, that can maximize customer retention and leverage that sales cost that we, we spend already uh, to capture a first sale. Fantastic. Um, so I, 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 the other thing I noticed and I was quite impressed with, like there, um, it doesn't seem like there's a typical customer. You do everything from quite small operations. I'd almost say like on a corporate level, all the way to, to mid-sized communities. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, there, there, there would be too small that we won't do like sure. household, uh, or, uh, we don't like too much, um, the, uh, like, house developer, unless he's providing us a letter of credit because those guys don't tend to last for a long time or yeah. are not being good payers. But, uh, you know, our, our, our sweet spot would be providing water treatment uh, equipment uh, for, the water, for the first pillar, for example, would be between half a million to five million, and we would go up to 10. Uh, and for operation and maintenance, uh, you know, we've got very tiny projects of $100,000 per year up to uh, $3 million per year. So that's kind of the bracket. But indeed, it's, it's the, it has to be a bit organized. Uh, so house, household developer, we don't like too much, but we've, we're doing some gated communities type of, um, and, and up to industries. Uh, we really, really like industrial customers. And that's, that's you know, the, the, uh, it, it's just, you know, more lumpy. It depends on the economical cycle, like oil and gas has, was very strong for a while. Now it has disappeared. And if, if your sales teams only focus towards that, I mean, they're missing on the opportunity. So uh, we, we're doing it with a focus on, on, on but never uh, close our eyes to other opportunities. Like right now, tech is strong. You know, we, we've done, uh, you know, projects for cooling towers for the data centers of Amazon, uh, worked with Apple. Uh, we looked at, at chips also facility uh, or in Tesla facility. So, you know, we're, we're working with the tech because they have a lot of money they, they, they're, and they're expanding. Um, 
food and brev food and beverages will always be there um, and and we have a very good expertise in sugar concentration using membrane filtration uh, so it, it needs to be opportunistic and, and and see what the trends of the uh, investment are coming from yeah that's like if you um I, you know, I heard you go in and you sort of refurbish or you take over sort of operations from some small to mid-sized communities. Uh, it, do you find more what I'd call greenfield opportunities where you're going into something brand new? Or are you typically going in and fixing an old problem or, or taking over an old problem? It's a, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, you know, when, when you see if, when you have been able to identify a facility that is suffering from, from bad operation uh, and, and, and coming there is, and, and fixing that you, you, it's really good that, that, that it's the only way to, to be able to capture a new business. So, uh, because it's a, it's a sticky business, eh? being in the water treatment, I mean, unless you screw up, I mean, you're never going to lose a contract. Right now we have hundred percent of renewals for our, all our operation and maintenance. So we've never lost a contract uh, because no one wants to take the risk of, of changing. So, so to capture a new business is not that easy. But uh, as you said, delivering a system with the operation and maintenance package, that's, that's ideal. Uh, but it's not that easy either because sometimes our clients already, you know, that are, are giving us a contract for water, uh, new equipment, they already have an operating team. Uh, so it's, uh, I'd say it, 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 it really, uh, ideally it's a, it's a new facility with, uh, with no operating team, like the, the, those type of projects we we're doing with sustainable water. Um, and, and then second is, is trying to, to, to know what are the systems that are suffering from, from being poorly operated and, and, uh, and the best is really working with, with cities. So not trying to steal business to competitors, that's, that's uh, harder, uh, but working with the cities that are having an issue with uh, compliance or certification or cost, uh, and, and then coming there as a solution for them. Uh, you know, in, in the market of operation and maintenance, it's only 10% of uh, all the, the municipalities and the states that have outsourced their uh, water and, and wastewater operation, only 10%. So 90% of it still uh, being operated by, by, by public workers uh, that are, are contracted by cities. So to, to go and, and, and offer that, uh, to privatize their, their operation and maintenance is, uh, is our strategy right now, working with cities and, and try to convert them into a privatization of O&M. Great. Um, so I imagine there's a lot of innovation in this type of business. Um, how much do you guys focus on internal innovation or how much is, is M&A uh, of new, new services and products? Yeah, so uh, I mean, you noticed our name is H2O Innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, indeed innovation is, is important uh, for us. The um, the, the, again, in the water, a bit like for operation and maintenance, no one wants to be the first one to try you. So launching a new innovation is a challenge. Uh, there are a lot of innovation, but, uh, the, you know, launching an innovation if you're a one product company is going to be extremely difficult. The way we're doing it is, is our, our, our business structure allows us to, 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 to be efficient when we, when we bring innovation and when we launch it. So, I showed a picture of Piedmont. Piedmont is, is probably one of our business that has uh, evolved the most uh, around innovation. So, so those are the, those big red tube and yellow and, and, and pink even here are, are cartridge filters, um, uh, sorry, filter housing in which there are cartridge filters into it. So, so those are big, big filters that you would put in front of a membrane plant, in front of a reverse osmosis plant. And, Inside, there are some, some filters uh, that, you know, will stop sand and, and other stuff to, to protect the membrane plant. Um, we've done another, a lot of innovation by, by bringing, you know, doing bigger ones, doing others in uh, reinforced fiberglass. So we brought a lot of innovation. If we, 
wouldn't have the structure of H2O, we would never been able to, to launch those products because we didn't have references. So uh, what we did is we launched those products and put them on our own system. So we kept that brand apart, but uh, sold that, well, sold that, and implement that on our systems of H2O, operate it, operate those systems. So we were able to build references. And when it was time to, to, to expand, uh, we already had built uh, enough references to qualify ourselves for the big project. So you can see the charge, the chart here on the right of that slide of the evolution of the revenues of Piedmont and, and was able to, uh, to quickly position itself, uh, you know, by, and, and it's a platform today to launch other products. So, so the strategy is to use Piedmont and, and, you know, bringing new product in through Piedmont, uh, but have, have tested those products and, and created references on the rest of the platform of H2O. And, and that makes us successful on the uh, R uh, R&D or, or innovation and, and development side. Gotcha. Um, back to M and A a little bit. Um, you've done a couple acquisitions here historically. Um, what do you look for when you're going out to acquire a company, and what, what kind of metrics around some of these acquisitions do we see? Yeah. So uh, our strategy uh, has been to to uh, to 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 do M and A. Uh, Right now, and, and I show this slide here, I like this slide 24. Uh, it, it, it's our history of H2O over the last um, 12 years now. How we have evolved the company from a, a being just a pro project company to uh, bringing some products and operation and maintenance. A project company is very lumpy and, and being publicly traded you know, no one wants to be lumpy. I mean, me as the CFO, I don't want to be lumpy and miss my targets because the project has been delayed or, or postponed or canceled. Uh, you as investors, you, you want us to deliver what we, uh, what the analyst and, and everyone sees we will be delivering. So, so what we will be looking at is predictability. So business that has, uh, you know, a certain predictability uh, by uh, having recurring revenues, uh, and, and also uh, a, a, an important focus for us has been to increase our profitability profile. So, uh, and, and a lot of focus has been put towards that, as you can see, uh, going from a 2% EBITDA to a 9% EBITDA for four years. Uh, so we don't want to go back there again, you know? <laughs> so so it, it will, when the focus will be uh, having businesses that are recurrent, that have you know a, 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 a comfortable profitability profile, and that can generate synergies with the rest of the organization in order to to even uh, create more accretion and, and leverage the organization. Right now, our focus, uh, you probably can tell from what I just told you, will be toward operation and maintenance. So adding uh, type both on type of acquisition in the O and M sector. Uh, it represents already 50% of our, of our revenues. I really don't mind continuing to increase it. It's, it's, you know, it's a great business. Uh, you know, it's very cash flow positive uh, and it's, it's not complicated. And there are many opportunities to sell other of, of the other uh, business pillars within uh, that sector because our customer may need consumables, they may need to upgrade their systems, they may need spare parts, and we can provide all that. Other way to improve the profitability is specialty products. So uh, bringing innovation comes with higher gross profit margin. And also uh, the chemicals comes with very high gross profit margin and the chemicals are very recurrent as well. So, uh, uh, you know, additional chemical companies, additional parts companies uh, and, and parts that we could integrate, parts that we could sell through our distribution network uh, or, or parts that we could, you know, work on and evolve in order to bring uh, innovation also. So really the focus will be towards the second and the third business pillar for the m and side. And give me maybe a bit of a breakdown in terms of what kind of gross margins you're seeing on the different sectors. Yeah. And we do disclose that in our financial statements. Uh, so what, what we talk about a lot uh, in our financial statements, uh, we call that EBAC, 
Uh, so we do disclose the gross profit margin, but but also the it's kind of the business EBITDA, so earning before admin cost. So all the admin costs are like head office, the cost of being public, uh, you know, accounting, HR, IT, legal, uh, all that stuff. We remove that from the business pillar and we leave that to the head office. So you really can see the performance of the business pillar. So keeping selling and operating costs. Um, in terms of gross profit margin, <clears throat> here you can see as, as a percentage of EBAC, uh, you, you will see that uh, a third business pillar uh, last year performed quite well with close to 15%. But you know, you, you, you'll see those O&M companies generally be between 10 and 15%. When we look at our comps, uh, they're between 10 and 15, top of the, the you know, best in class are around 15%. So last year we, we did very well and, and, and hopefully we'll stay there, uh, continue to operate, uh, to, to operate like that. Um, then, when you look at uh, this business pillar, so the uh, second business pillar for specialty products, <clears throat> that has four different line of revenues. So we've got the chemical business lines, peat month, and, and that's uh, industrial slash, uh, it's maple, but it's really it's providing water treatment plants for the maple producers in Canada, but also in sugar concentration and uh, work also in irrigation. Uh, and as you can see here, it's a nicer uh, profitability uh, in this case, you know, above, uh, it's around 22% right now. So, uh, you know, depending on the business mix, if we've got more chemicals, this will go up. If you got uh, more, some, some maple products have, have less gross profit margin, uh, so it'll go down a bit. But, but, you know, it'll be anywhere between uh, you know, the gross profit margins in the area of 40%, and then uh, depending on the selling cost and operating, you'll end up with an EBAC that will be in the area of uh, 20 to 22%. And if we go to the first pillar, uh, that's the, the, the nightmare for the CFO. It's lumpy, it doesn't come <laughs> with higher gross profit margin, but it's a hell of a differentiator when, you know, in terms of, of engineering. Uh, uh, and, and that comes with uh, an EBAC of about 5%. So the project business is, you know, will be between 20 to, to, to 18 to 20 percent, but the costs uh, uh, are higher in the selling cost. We just did a restructuration at the at year end, and and uh, you know that that EBAC should be improved next year because we've removed some costs to it due to the decrease here we've had uh, earlier last year. But I imagine that I mean that that's that's a, a prelude to. Um, you know, higher margin, other products and services. Every time you make a sale, even if it, even if you were to break even on this, you're you're still likely to have a long tail with the other revenue you generate, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So we we can't. When you look at it as a standalone, it's not that interesting. But obviously, uh, the fact that it creates recurring revenues in the tail end and and and, and yeah. long tail end generally, uh, you know, yeah. on a twenty year basis, it's, it's a very good business to be in. Yeah. Good, good. Um, well, I mean, m and is pretty dependent on making sure you have uh, the right strategy and the right people to execute. Maybe, maybe spend a little bit of time on the management team and what you can tell us about them. Yeah, so, uh, well, management team is, is, I say, young but experienced. I mean, we all in the mid 40s, the, the officers, uh, we have uh, been with the company for for, for many years. Uh, Frederick de Grey, who's the CEO, has founded a company while he was just out of university uh, 20 years ago. And uh, so today the company is 20 years old. Uh, and, and today, uh, last, recently, two weeks ago, we, 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 were, uh, we won uh, the uh, Water Company of the Year from Global Water Intelligence. So that's the most prestigious award you can have in the industry. Uh, so it's a, it's a you know, overnight, uh, well, they say what's the expression, overnight success after 20 years. Um, and and uh, myself and Guillaume, uh, Guillaume's the chief operating officer, I'm the chief mm -hmm. financial officer. We, uh, you know, I've been with the company, Guillaume, I think it's been 14 years. I've been with the company for 12 years now. Uh, so we, we've basically kind of built this company and the rest of the, 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 the other layer of management uh, also been with the company, all of them for seven to 10 years. Um, and, and a lot of guys have, have uh, evolved before at the other big uh, competitors such as PAL, uh, 
uh, affiliate of Danaher or G. Uh, we have a lot of former like Xenon. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. some of you remember Xenon. Xenon for sure. That was uh, bought by GE. So mm -hmm. we we have uh, their former uh, VP of engineering there. He's our uh, head of project. Um, their CTO, uh, Chief Technological Officer, the guy that put his name on all the patents is, is Pierre Cote, he's on our board. Uh, so uh, we have a, a strong team of manager uh, that are used to, uh, well, they understand the company, the value and the strategy, uh, but also have, are used to, to integrate the companies we've, we've bought. We, we, we um, have involved them a lot into the integration. Uh, for every deal, we do a roadmap. We're very methodic in, in our way of, of uh, uh, executing strategic plan, business plan, and, and integration plan. So always working with uh, smart objective roadmaps. You know, it's, you'd say it's the basic, but we, uh, we even have uh, someone uh, dedicated to follow those roadmaps. Uh, she's a woman at our uh, financial department. So. Um, yeah, so that, that's how we that's how we proceed. Great, uh, thank you for that. Um, so you know, obviously with M and A, uh, you require a, a balance sheet that allows you to do that. Maybe spend a, a minute or two just explaining where you are balance sheet wise. Yeah, uh, it's a perfect. Good timing. I was going there. Um, right. So our, our net debt right now stands at ten point five uh, million. So with the uh, EBITDA of twelve point five. So our, our our debt EBITDA ratio is below one. Uh, we uh, had nine million of cash at year end, uh, but remember uh, we did the, the next day, so that's on June 30. The next day we did an acquisition in Houston uh, where we subscribed for a bit more than two million of additional debt. So, so basically our net debt should be closer to 12-ish here, 12.5 at year end. Uh, <clears throat> since we did an acquisition the following day, but still, nevertheless, it, it is below one time uh, debt EBITDA. So we're, we're not over leveraged. We like where we at. Uh, we generate good cash flow, as you can see here on that next, next slide. Um, we, uh, we uh, yeah, as I say, we were able to deleverage the company, uh, you know, easily by, by uh, reimbursing our debt on a regular, uh, very regularly and, and from quarter to quarter. Um, so in terms of, of uh, funding M&As in the future, we, uh, we believe we, you know, our strategy is to add some Botan uh, acquisition that we will be paying for operation and maintenance between five to seven times EBITDA. Uh, and, and we're looking at companies between five to 15, 20 millions of revenues. Uh, and those companies are in the area of 10% EBITDA, let's say, as I said earlier. So, uh, so you know, part of it can be funded through debt. Part of it can be funded through uh, earnout, as we did. Uh, we like earnouts a lot into these type of deals. Uh, and if it would be a bigger deal that would require equity, we would come to equity, but we would not dilute the company for uh, a project that doesn't bring any accretion. Uh, our comfort of, of debt equity ratio um, won't be above two and a half. I'm not uh, a fan, you know, I, we've been to special account a few years ago, don't wanna ever go back there again. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. Uh, so I, I rather take a more conservative approach uh, in terms of that, the debt ratio and FCCR. So um, we have a healthy balance sheet and want to keep it that way. We believe it's a differentiator and, and, and more than now, more than ever. I mean, with, with the, the uncertainty on the market. Um, and in terms of, of uh, maybe uh, M&A opportunities for specialty products, uh, there are companies that, that would be paid a bit more, uh, six to nine times EBITDA. And, uh, and, and so again, I mean, if, if, uh, if it wouldn't be accretive, we won't bring it uh, for, for, for to the market to, to rate to increase equity. And um, now let, let's talk a little bit about the stock if we can. Um, yeah. I, I think you have around 77 or 78 million shares outstanding if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, what kind of insider ownership do you have? So insiders, uh, Fred, Yom and myself, I mean, we've diluted ourselves a lot over the years, unfortunately, but we, we combined, we still have about just 4% you know, ish of, uh, of, of ownership. Then we have a board member that has been with us for a few years that uh, is a private, it's an American guy, a private uh, investor who owns about six, 
7%. So, you know, I would say board and, and management have about 10%. Mm -hmm. um, then you have some anchor shoulders, uh, Investment Quebec, La Caisse de Depot, and BDC Capital. Uh, the Green Fund, there's, they, they've got a Green Fund at BDC. Uh, and combined, the three of them have about 35%. So uh, their objective is obviously they have a mandate, you know, a bit different each, from each other, but, but basically the mandate is to encourage, you know, Canadian and, and Quebec companies to grow and, and, and develop strong head office and presence internationally, strong head office here and presence internationally. Uh, so we're well supported by them. And, and now, uh, I mean, you probably saw the volume. Uh, there, there's been a bit of a switch, I would say, in, in certain shelters, I guess. Uh, we, you know, we've talked to a lot of shelters over the last few months. We, it's been uh, uh, the, the last few weeks. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, traction and, and, and I would say we see more and more institutional shelters. We used to see a lot of, of wealth management type of investors and uh, um, and, and IAs, you know, investors, advisors that were retail, that were investing into H2O, that while it was a bit of a risky pick. And, and what I've seen more and more are, are funds that we've been talking to many years and now they seem to be willing to take a position. Uh, and so that's the, that's the switch of shoulder we kind of see right now. We feel we see it uh, having, you know, smaller uh, institutional shoulders that are, that are joining the story. I understand you, you do have uh, institutional coverage, like you've got, uh, I think it's Industrial yeah. Alliances covering you. Is there anyone else covering you right now? So uh, Industrial Alliance, Desjardins, Beacon Securities, Haywood, uh, Can Accord had something, so now their analyst left and they, I, I expect to see a new coverage sooner and later. Uh, I mm -hmm. think it'll be around our first quarter, the release of our first quarter, so that's Can Accord. And uh, in the States, there is an analyst at Roth Capital. Uh, okay. The guy specialized in water, uh, so he covers us. Uh, and, and yeah, so. Oh, good. You, you get fairly good institutional, or small, at least small cap institutional coverage. Yeah, good. and there's Acumen, Acumen out of Western Canada. And Acumen, okay, good. Yeah. 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 So indeed, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a nice coverage now. Yeah, right on, right on. Um, listen, I, I mean, usually we get a few questions. It looks like we've done a really good job because no, no, none of our listeners have asked us questions. So that, <laughs> that means we've covered off a lot. Um, if, if there is any last second uh, question, you guys feel free to use the chat function. Um, but um, otherwise, I mean, usually what we like to do is, is wrap up by just allowing you to sort of summarize or if there's a key message you want investors to sort of take away from uh, from this presentation, you know, it, you know, the next five minutes are yours. Well, maybe to, to wrap it up, I mean, uh, I, I said it a lot, uh, you know, a, a lot of our focus is to, uh, yes, increase revenue, but uh, also maximize profitability, increase the profitability profile of the company. Uh, we are in an environmental uh industry. Uh, ESG is a nice theme, uh, but we also understand that we need to, to be profitable and we need to bring sustainability for the investors, bring predictability, uh, deliver the forecast, deliver the, the, what, we, what we're looking at and what we say we will be doing. And, and, and we have been able to prove it uh, over the last few years. And, and, and we're very confident we'll be able to continue to prove that because uh, our business model allows it with, you know, a lot of predictability. We have uh, our backlog. I didn't talk about it, but the backlog is above 100 million right now. And 86% and or 85-ish percent of our revenues are, are recurrent, are recurrent in, uh, in, in uh, different ways by operation and maintenance or consumables, but bring a lot of recurrency to the revenues and, and therefore bring that predictability uh, for the uh, for the investors, we are in an industry that you know is, is recession proof. I mean, water, as I said earlier, it's uh, it's uh, you know people will continue to flush toilets and drink water no matter what if there is a pandemic or not. Uh, investor, uh, sorry, uh, stimulus money that may be injected in the economy 
right now are not forecasted. So we don't build our business on that. If this comes, it will be over and above. So, uh, and our business model generates a lot of cash, uh, which can feed uh, m and activities. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and we have the place on our balance sheet to do it. Um, so uh, essentially we, we, we feel that we are in a very good shape to continue to grow organically and through m and without dilu diluting uh, our investors and continue to generate uh, generate a nice uh, a nice return on investment for for investors and 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 we don't believe that right now the stock price is is a spike. Uh, I don't know if I can position myself, but but I, I just think it's an adjustment of the valuation and and being the fact that we are on the screen, uh, we have a lot of uh, additional value to bring and and that's what we will continue to demonstrate over the next few quarters. Fantastic, Mark. Um, you know, water, a lot of smart people believe water is one of the, uh, the sort of the, the big industries to look out for over the next 10, 20 years. Um, infrastructure is another big theme. I'd say environmental, um, you know, uh, companies are another major theme. I think you've covered off uh, a few of those. Um, certainly, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. I think we've covered a lot. Uh, the company is H2O Innovations. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, CFO Mark Blanchett. Um, I want to thank you one more time and uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you guys uh, in, in the near future. Well, thanks to you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Uh, really appreciate it to have the chance to, to share a story with you guys today. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Trevor, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mark. And before we sign off today, Mark, um, if investors are looking for more information on the company, what's the website address? H2Innovation.com. And uh, if you have any question, you can also uh, reach out to uh, investor at H2Innovation.com. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Mark. And uh, looking forward to uh, our future calls. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.